different location, if you can tell, I'm not at home. I am in Cornwall celebrating my mum's birthday and I wanted to do a little impromptu vlog situation. I haven't really felt like vlogging recently, um, but I thought while I was here trying to read, I could, um, yeah, let you know how it's going. I'll first I'll show you what books I bought with me, then what I'm reading and how I'm feeling about it. So in terms of what I packed, I bought, I really, not overpacked because I also bought my COVID, but I just sort of have honestly been having a hard time recently, like haven't been reading consistently, haven't really even felt that like reading has felt like just not enjoyable. Like I've been picking up the book and just the words don't mean anything to me. Hard time, you know, getting meaning from the novels that I'm picking up, which is a really annoying because there's so many good books that I've bought recently that I'm like really excited to read and really keen to share my thoughts on, but I just, everything I pick up, I just feel really meh. Like, but it, I know, like I've never been more certain of something that it's not the, these books fault. It's definitely just how I'm feeling at the moment. Um, just quite burnt out of reading, I think, and having, after having a really good reading summer, coming into the autumn now, I just, yeah, need to refine my routine at home and how reading fits into that routine, I guess, which is very different to like reading while you're traveling or reading um, while you're on holiday and stuff like that. So lots of things are shifting work-wise and life-wise right now. So I need to establish my home routine and hopefully within that, I can find a place for reading again that doesn't just a couple of pages before I close my eyes at night kind of thing. So anyway, I bought with me Bellies by Nicola uh, Dinan because so many of my friends when I put this in a whole video said they loved it so much and that I would get so much from it and I kind of regret not starting this and honestly the book I started was because it was the paperback in my handbag um, but I'm kind of too far in now to give up on it. I could, but I've DNF'd a lot of things recently. So anyway, I know I'm really keen to read this and it's almost motivating to finish, help me finish my current read because I know I have this sitting, waiting for me. So perhaps I will pick this up on the train. Tom, you know, you're in the background of my video. You're now. No, now you're not. Rudy, Tom brief interlude for Tom to be running around in a towel in the background. Um, the other book I bought with me when I thought I might be in the root for, mood for non-fiction is another book I saw, all of these are in a recent video, but this is You've Changed, essays about life as a woman from Burma and I've been really keen to pick this one up as well and I thought maybe essays would be quite interesting to read and I quite like an essay when I'm traveling on the train or just sort of ease myself back into it so that I had with me as well. And then my mum just finished My Husband by Maud Ventura. I sent her the link to buy this because I knew it would be right up her street. And I am so excited to read this. She really enjoyed it. It's like a delusional woman on the edge type middle-aged book like Mrs. March by Virginia Vito and Vladimir, those kinds of books, which I find much more appealing and much more interesting than sort of typical young 20s depressed women moving through the world kind of novels at this point in my life. So this one is translated, I believe, from the Norwegian. Let me check. Oh no, perhaps from the French. I lied. Um, and yeah, it follows a successful woman losing her mind. But my mum said that she didn't give away the ending, but she just said, husband and wife are both equally to blame so it's compared to Gone Girl which, and the towns of Mr Ripley and you so yeah it's definitely one of those sort of psychological literary explorations um and I'm so glad to have her to have lent me this copy I love the cover as well and then the book I ended up picking up because I like I said it was the one that was the paperback in my handbag is to Polo Blue by James Carhill. So this is, I'm only 80 pages in. So f we follow a esteemed academic at Cambridge, who's one of the fellows in the late 80s, but he's been there at this point for like 30 years. And he's a art historian. He goes on the radio and he says something and essentially can no longer be a fellow anymore like I guess a version of cancelled so he moves to London into his friend's apartment and starts a new job as the 
um, director of like operations or the like the main chairman of a prestigious but small museum that hosts some of the art that he loves there is he's a single man in his later life um, has never married or dated there is an assumption or some inklings that he is a queer man and he has a best friend at the university who was sort of his mentor when he was doing his PhD and it's that's the house that he's gone to live in in London was is owned by this person and there's sort of hints that perhaps they sh have more feelings for each other than they've ever admitted and they are both like single queer men uh, living in a time where that wasn't necessarily accepted in academia so the context is really interesting I just don't know if it's a bit ham fisted and I'm I don't know there's something that is not like instantly appealing to me uh, to read about like older white men in academia that's not like a, a, a character study that I necessarily have a lot of time for I guess so it's not it hasn't won me over completely but now we've got past the cancellation section and we're moving into him moving into London setting this new job and the back sort of says like he's gonna I guess go on a journey of self-discovery and a later life experiences to do with his desire and his romance and his sexuality so I'm hoping that like new version of London in the 90s is more interesting than like the stuffy Cambridge stuff which I, I just don't find interesting to read about but like I say I'm only 80 pages in and the jury's out so far but I'm gonna keep going because now it's getting better the more I'm reading it and like I say I think a good portion of me feeling stuck with books is just a mindset shift and having to negotiate a new reading experience for the autumn so that is the current read but I am have been doing a lot of audiobooks recently so I just am halfway through probably towards the end of a book called I'm gonna check the name it's a non-fiction book about North Korea it's called North Korea's Hidden Revolution how an underground information is changing North Korea it was written a few years ago all of the books I seem to read about North Korea are written in the 2010s. I guess that was sort of a publishing trend at the time for Western publishing houses to produce these kinds of books. But it's really interesting. It, it focuses in on, like it says, information spread. And it's talking about disseminating information through illegal radio stations, um, defector led information that goes across on like balloons through leaflets. Uh, foreign film and TV that's uh, distributed through DVDs and video and cassettes and it follows a reporter talking to various different dissidents and um, defectors who operate perhaps for the pirate radio stations or who have worked to transfer information across in various ways and I think it's going to move right now we're talking about sort of in the famine period and how that was a, a real spike in defectors and I think it's going to move towards the 2000s and sort of start to talk about like DVDs and USBs and it's really compelling and well written and of course harrowing to read about especially the stuff related to the famine and like public execution but a really interesting case study on the power of information and the power of knowledge and how that uh, closed society is only successful through the limitation of information which if you remember a few months ago i read the book about the education system in north korea and an elite university where a reporter went up undercover as a teacher and talked then about sort of young north koreans men's understanding of the internet and how they assumed sort of how they have access to the intranet which is like a closed circuit system but they believe that's the same as the open internet and how that uh, misinformation spreads and yeah, really, really interesting. And I like a focus. I've read uh, like most of the popular defector memoir stories and this sort of reported style book on the country, I find um, is much more what I'm interested in at the moment reading on this topic because it's, it really um, takes a lot of different case studies and the author interviews various sort of different people who, like I say, are working for dissident organizations in China, in South Korea, in America. And for example, she interviews one person who is working to, as part of like a food bank, giving out um, hot meals in a Seoul train station. And they're like a network of, of North Korean defectors that do it sort of as a way to show 
South Koreans that they're not a burden on society because there's quite a prejudice towards North Korean defectors living in Seoul who are um, sort of using, I guess, social resources. But she talks to the author and says, like, my story of defection is not like the ones you read in the papers. It's not all glitzy and glammy. It doesn't have that real, like, um, Hollywood factor to it. So I think it's important that I tell it to you because the West obviously only ever interprets the most extreme versions of these stories. So I thought that tidbit in itself and that being included in the book was quite self-aware and, uh, yeah, notable. So I am enjoying listening to that as well. And then also, it's my mum's birthday tomorrow, like I said, and Tom and I bought her some books. So maybe about once she opens them, I'll show them to you as well, because that's also interesting. Um, for now, we're off for dinner, and I'll catch you when I've perhaps read some more of this. <laughs> friends as you can see i'm not in fact still in cornwall i'm back in amsterdam i didn't finish this video but i wanted to update you on my reading and i also lied again didn't i because i did dnf this book because it was shit like i just didn't care i got to page 124 and there was this is the thing with like i don't often read a lot of like mass market paperback size books so there was 300 and 40 pages in this so even though I'd read over 100 pages I was only a third of the way through and I thought I can't do this for another two thirds Don you're a fucking snore sorry we were briefly interrupted there while I had to send voice notes to a friend who's trying to deal with Dutch bureaucracy so yes Don is a snore I wasn't invested in it I think sometimes these literary fiction books that use a lot of art like art history, which is fairly common, I think, in some of the books I read, particularly books that are around um, in academia. If the context of the history being referenced, like these paintings, in so much detail, I just don't care. Like, it's, I, it's not something that drives me to pick up the book, whereas I think it can, you can talk about visual art in a really interesting way in a lot of literature, and there are really good examples of that. And I just think when it it feels almost like the author wishes they wrote the book uh, the non-fiction book that their character is writing type thing so i just wasn't compelled by this plot i was frustrated by how on the nose some of the conversation around cancel culture and sort of like old versus new in terms of academic hierarchy and diversity and equity in the institutions like none of it was written in a very appealing or inventive manner that I was just kind of like oh I'm over it so perhaps it's one of those books that pays off in the second half but I just wasn't in the mood to find out so that's going to be a no from me but I then did go on to read really quite quickly you've changed uh the essays about being a young woman in Myanmar um or a Myanmar woman living in various places between the UK and Myanmar and America <sighs> I really enjoyed these I thought they were 
they were just really honestly what I was in the mood for and I think it was just a good book at a good time. I haven't read nonfiction like physically in a while. I've been listening to a lot of audio nonfiction over the summer. Oh, I did also finish the North Korean audio book and I did really enjoy that. Um, so it was nice to pick up an ex essay collection that wasn't incredibly intellectually dense and sort of big thinking. It was um, a lot of personal conversation about identity and that was romantic relationships with a British man and the psychological and sort of personal impact that borders and nationalities and visas and nation state ideology has on on people on individuals um and I really enjoyed lots of that conversation and it was very at some points funny and heartfelt a lot in here about food and cooking and I really enjoyed the essay actually on baking where she talks about the um, lack of baking tradition in Myama culture and how her grandmother and her mother are huge cooks and like can cook several different curries all at once and the history of rice and the conversation around fat phobia but how baking was never a tradition and how baking feels like very western and like Sally's baking blog who's blonde hair blue eyed and her grandmother passed down her recipe for apple tart and I thought that essay was really interesting and conversations on equity in publishing and producing work for a gaze which is something I think about and write about quite often as well I think some of the essays could have gone a little deeper for me or a little bit more had a bit more meat to them there was sort of a few occasions which is just like a personal pet peeve of mine where an essay sort of says like the essayist is quite casual in referencing something else like oh I read a statistic once that said this but it's not like properly referenced or um I don't know it's not as tightly factual as perhaps I would have liked in those instances I understand it's obviously a personal collection but yeah it was it was a really interesting and um joyful and complicated conversation around identity and it was a really good time so I'm pleased actually in the end that I continued my DNF streak and ended up getting rid of this because this was so much better. I wanted to pick it up. I read it on the train and on the Eurostar and it was just like really like a book to that I had in my handbag that I was reaching for while I was out and about and I haven't done that in really so long. I've only ever been listening to audiobooks while I've been around because I couldn't really sink my teeth into this one. So that was really nice and we shall see what other books I get up to reading now that I'm home, so I'll catch you guys next time I'm reading something new.
friends, another weekend has passed and I'm here to tell you about what I got up to. Hopefully you just saw in the past clips, I actually went to a literary festival with two bookish friends here in the city and it was so much fun. My friend knew the curators and I hadn't honestly heard about it, it was on Nord, uh, so across the river and it was such a beautiful venue. It's at the Tollhostein. I don't think they translated to the toll house, which is I've never been there before, but it was like this gorgeous garden with all of these different seats and um, food trucks. And I saw Hello and Habila, who wrote Oil and Water, which the book Tom and I adored when we read it a few years ago. And we heard um, him be interviewed by a Dutch writer talking about the five books that made him the writer that he is now. It was called The Library of Helen. And he was so charismatic and funny and joyful. And they, the both the authors had like a rapport and knew each other and it was really fun. And to watch them engage and discuss, um, yeah, all the different books that inspired his writing. He talked about sort of African tradition of writing and where he came from and how he thinks it's so important to read your roots but then read outside of your roots and sort of establish yourself as your own writer and it was really um, invigorating and enjoyable and then we had some supper and some drinks and there was a book like market going on somewhere closed by the time we came out of our first talk which I wish I had looked before but perhaps I saved myself money in the end um and then we went upstairs into the main venue it was also the staff was so kind it was so well organized they were really on top of it with on top of it with access and even for being like a small mostly volunteer run festival they couldn't have been more helpful when it came to accessibility which we love to see and then we went to see Travis Alabanza with another Dutch, she's a British writer. Um, and then we saw her speak with a, another writer whose book was in Dutch. And also a lot of the festival was in Dutch and English and they had really sophisticated and elaborate like subtitling going on for the dual language which I thought was really cool I hadn't seen it by that before and I think it was called the talk was called something like things people say to me um, and the other author their name has slipped my mind but their book was about um, racism in the Netherlands and it was called 365 days of being Dutch and it was all the different interactions they have um, and microaggressions they'd experience as a non-white Dutch speaking person living in the Netherlands they are I don't keep up with like Dutch media but they are sort of or were famous in their field for like news reporting and production and like on the radio and on the big tv stations and stuff and then they'd gone on to write this book so it was just so so brilliant to hear them speak and it was just yeah, really joyful to spend an evening doing that um because i haven't been to see like live literary stuff in such a long time and as i said while we were there i did indeed purchase some books and i'm not sorry about it the first book i bought was from let me not even attend this because i'm so tired <laughs> i'm not on the energy <laughs> Do Dutch words today from this bookstore. They had a stand that I hadn't heard of this bookstore before, um, but I really now want to go and visit it. It opened in 1977. It's a non commercial, collectively run bookstore with critical and insurgent literature. We only work with volunteers and profits go into the store or the groups involved in extra par parliamentary activity from pirates to punk rock. We try to bring you information and inspiration for resistance against repressions in many forms. So they had an impeccable selection, a lot of Verso, a lot of Pluto Press, um, a lot of intersectional feminist works, a lot of um, gender literature and also some great like novels and stuff that I have loved in the past. So I loved their selection and now I must find my way to their actual store to visit them. But I only picked up one book. I honestly didn't know what to pick. I just really wanted to support them. I ended up getting the Audrey Lord's The Cancer Journals. This is, of course, a very, oh, got two bookmarks, a very famous and seminal text when it comes to writing about illness. I've read a couple of the essays 
um, before, like been set them in um, studies, but I haven't had a copy and read it all the way through. And I often shy away from reading about cancer. And I think cancer literature as sort of a genre or a, a category of illness writing stands to me quite separately from the disability justice reading and writing that I do. And I think cancer has a certain position of hierarchy when it comes to non-disabled non -disabled people's understanding of illness and that through no fault of the people who've suffered with cancer has had a detrimental impact on people's ability to understand illnesses that don't follow that curve of recovery and or death. So yeah, I don't often read them, but for Audrey Lord, of course, I trust her with my heart and soul. And I know that um, I'll get a lot out of this book and she will bring grace and enlightenment to the topic of illness. So I'm excited to finally read this in its like from like cover to cover. And then I also picked up after listening to them speak, Travis Alabanza's None of the Above Reflections on Life Beyond the Binary. It's a book that I'd obviously like seen a plenty of people talk about before and seen it in floating around the ether, but thought it was a memoir in quite a straightforward sense of the word. But hearing Travis talk about um, their choices in the way that can, they constructed this narrative, it sounded quite experimental and inventive. And they actually read um, in one of the readings they gave an alternative ending that their sort of editor and publisher didn't want to be put out there which I loved so much and I loved their off-handed comments and sort of yeah conversation around writing and publishing specifically as a marginalised person so I'll just read you the back it says in none of the above Travis Alabanza examines seven phrases people have directed at them as a black mixed race non-binary person some are deceptively innocuous, some are deliberately loaded or offensive, some are celebratory. Sentences that have impacted them for the better and the worse, sentences that speak to the broader issue raised by the world that insists that gender must be binary. So each essay takes a phrase um, and unpacks the phrase, the experience of hearing it for the first time and then attempts to recontextualize the phrase in a way that isn't harmful and I, I think the way they spoke about the joy that um, this book gave there was a lot of conversation between the three authors or the two authors and the let's say the solicitor um, who do I mean the moderator um, about writing as catharsis writing as therapy writing for public uh, consumption um, they talked about the ways that they yeah, I thought this, the way that they took on the storytelling in this book felt way more joyful than if they were going to write it as a straight sort of memoir of the tragedy of my life, all the bad things that have ever happened to me. And they spoke, one of my favourite bits of the whole um, talk was they read a passage from this chapter, which is called This Ain't a Thing We Do Around His Son. And Travis and the other author the other author told then a story about her experience of being called daughter and in her um in her language how daughter in her cultural community can be seen as a word that brings someone in and can be a comfort and a and a joy and entering into uh, another person's family but it's also a word that's used to police women and say like my daughter wouldn't do that daughter you shouldn't be doing that and this um travis and her spoke a lot about that when it came to like sons and daughters and these words that can so easily bring us in and make us feel safe and can also in the same breath be used to exclude or police. So yeah, I just really loved their talk so much. And um, this book I bought from The Base Book Space, which is an online bookstore in the Netherlands that sells great books by black authors as their tagline goes. And I'm so excited to have like an indie online bookstore to order um great black literature from so if you are a uh dutch person looking for new places to buy books check them out as well so yes that was my weekend i'm now in the middle of finishing like a few unfinished books and then i'm excited to create a bit of an autumn reading list and sing my
knew it was too good to be true it was gonna fall at some point um and sink my teeth into all of the new things that i have picked up including these so i'll see you guys in the next one bye